Welcome to Shannon's Club TV, the show for all motoring enthusiasts to relive the histories of cars on Australian roads and racetracks. In each episode, we profile our feature car with rare images, new insights, and an owner's well-preserved example. We'll also get the latest market news from the Shannon's auctions team. So let's get things rolling with the British sedan that was Chrysler's answer to the Ford Cortina, the Hillman Hunter. When Chrysler completed its takeover of the Roots Group in 1967, it acquired the Port Melbourne factory where Hillman Minx's Singer Gazelles, Humber Vogues and more had been assembled from CKD kits since the 1950s. But Australian management refused Chrysler's edict from Detroit to display the new company name Chrysler Roots Australia on the factory. That same year, the new Hillman Hunter, codenamed Arrow, went into local production. At first, there were just two variants, the entry-level Arrow with bench front seat and the mainstream Hunter. Both got the 1725cc engine. The Hillman Hunter competed directly, both in the UK and Australia, with the Mark II Cortina. There was even a similarity in styling. Mark, the Hunter might have looked like mm. the Mark II Cortina, but there was hardly a Lotus Hunter, no. was there? No, we never got one of those. Did anyone expect a Hillman to win the London to Sydney rally? Well, probably not. But, you know, in that context, the fact that it was such a simple and conventional car was probably an advantage because, you know, the less moving parts you have, the less there are to break. And a lot of people wouldn't have been aware, too, of the very clever vehicle preparation and logistics by Roots Group behind that campaign to make that car as successful as it was, which I'll get to a bit later. In 1969, the Hunter GT followed Ford's Cortina example with a walnut dashboard and extra grunt. By this time, the Hunter had received a minor facelift. Chrysler Australia added a safari wagon, the sub-brand chosen to emphasise its family connection with the Valiant. They were difficult days when it came to comprehensive insurance. Underwriters took exception to badges such as GT, GTS and SS. Chrysler responded by introducing a stripper version of the GT known as the Hustler and renaming the Hunter GT, the Hunter Royal 660. For all the world, the Hustler, with its garish paint colours and decals, was a mini pacer. But three years after the awesome Datsun 1600, it represented a case of not quite enough, much too late. Lots of Valiant was creeping into the last ever Hillmans to be sold in Australia, including the steering wheel, and for the Royal 660, the same buffalo grain vinyl trim as used in the Regal 770. But the Roots era was spent. The slick little Mitsubishi Colt Galant, with better performance, higher quality and contemporary styling, was about to revitalise Chrysler Australia's presence in the four-cylinder market. The last Aussie Hunter was built in 1972, but stock lingered for a year. Mark, I guess the Hunter's main claim to fame is that victory by Andrew Cowan. Oh, without a doubt. But I think a lot of people would not be aware that a similar model also competed at Bathurst. The Hillman Hunter scored one of motorsport's most famous victories in the 1968 London to Sydney Marathon. Andrew Cowan's achievement was widely unexpected, given that the Roots Group could only afford to back one car on a limited budget, compared to the multi-car factory teams assembled by Ford and British Leyland. However, what the Roots Group lacked in spending power, it more than made up for with clever and thorough preparation. Cowan was famously quoted as requesting a car that was built to come last, which was the Canny Scott's succinct way of saying that only a very solidly built and low-stressed car could win. And he was proved correct. The works Hillman Hunter benefited from smart planning, including the use of different cylinder heads for the first and second legs to cope with variable fuel quality and a very strong Aston Martin rear end. After the first leg from London to Bombay, the Hillman crew comprising Cowan, co-driver Colin Malkin and navigator Brian Coyle were in sixth place. And after the field was shipped to WA for the final run from Perth to Sydney, they seized on various mishaps suffered by rival crews to claim what for many was considered a victory against the odds. 
John, you know, Cowan's win was the classic hare and tortoise sort of tale. But I don't think Chrysler Australia really capitalised on that victory in terms of selling the, the Hunter from then on. I don't think they did, mm. no. No, I don't think they, they did. It was kind of wrapping up the fish and chips, the ads, and then, then gone and forgotten. That was something they could have carried on, you would have thought, over a couple of years. Yeah, but it's, it, was a, it was an awkward relationship, that Chrysler Roots Group situation, because you know, rumour has it that Chrysler Australia didn't even know there was a Roots Group entry in the event, and it was only when they were about halfway across Australia, when Cowan was starting to move up, they went, hang on, what have we got here? Like, they weren't even aware that they had a car in there. That's, that's how how disjointed that whole relationship was between Roots and Chrysler. I think also with the passing of the years, mm. and you look at something so specialised as the 12-hour as the race at Bathurst mm. now, and the cars that are built to win that, that a Hillman Hunter could have won such a major event, such a simple, humble car, mm. could have won such a huge event. It, it, it beggars belief. <laughs> it does, even today when you even look Even today, back. especially today. Yeah. yeah. Perhaps less known is that a similar model also competed briefly at Bathurst in the annual 500-mile race for stock standard road cars. The entry-level Arrow was the preferred weapon of choice, as its lower level of standard equipment meant it was also lighter than the Hunter. Two Arrows were entered for the 1967 race, where they faced the formidable task of toppling BMC's dominant Mini Cooper in Class B. As expected, a Mini won, but the new Hillmans were far from disgraced in finishing second and third. One Arrow returned in 1968 for its final Bathurst appearance, this time facing another superior Class B rival in the new Datsun 1600. As expected, the Japanese cars dominated, claiming first, second and third. However, the Hillman crew did again finish, proving, just like Andrew Cowan, that the British design Hillman was tough enough for Australia. Remember to join the Shannons Club, where you can connect with other enthusiasts around the country. Hi guys, Tony Hanson here from Shannon's Auctions in Melbourne, and here we have a 1970 Hillman Hunter Royale sedan. This particular car is only showing just over 48,000 genuine miles on the clock. It's a three owner car, well looked after, well maintained, and very, very original. The Hillmans came in a four door sedan version. There was also a station wagon and the GT spec for the boy racer at the time. The Hillman Hunter was introduced in 1966 by the Chrysler organisation to compete with the Cortinas and the Tiranas. The little Hillmans held their own between the, the other cars on the market at the time, the Cortinas, the Datsuns and the Tiranas. Good value for money, plenty of room in the back for the kids, good family motoring in this particular car. I would think the most famous motorsport history for this particular model is the win at the London and Sydney Marathon back in 1968. The Hillmans actually drive quite nicely. This is a four-speed manual car, which is nice to drive, keeps up with modern traffic. A bit of a pleasure, actually. This car presents very nicely. We haven't really done a lot to the car. We've gave it a, a little bit of a wash when it first came in. It was a little bit dirty, but it's just as it is. If you're in the market for a Hillman, the best thing to do is contact some of the clubs around, make sure there's no rust in the car, make sure it's got all the original components. There are a few available on the market at the moment, just make sure you get a nice original car. Shannon's National Auctions Manager Chris Borabon joins us to bring us up to speed on the Hillman Hunter. Hello, Hello, mate. How are you? Welcome, Chris. Five years the Hillman Hunter was sold in Australia yeah. from 1967 to 72, but I don't reckon there'd be too many left now. What do you think? Yeah, look, I think uh, that's a good point. Mm. I, I think the survival rate on that's the, the hunters are fairly low today. Yeah. Um, again, in their day, they were quite a you know good, good entry level uh, family vehicle, popular at the time, mm. uh, affordable and. Um, but I think over the years, we, you know, we, we today we don't really see many of them at all. Uh, so I think you know, that even the different variants. I mean, it's yeah, scarce. Is the that victory in the uh, the London to Sydney marathon? I mean, that was decades ago. But is that, yeah. does that still, you know, have a, have a good effect on buyers? Do they still remember that or? 
I don't think it, I don't think it does. Mm. I think it, you know maybe that that probably comes out in clubs. Yeah. Um, you know where they do relive obviously those uh, those days. Well, it was its most famous yeah, famous win. Absolutely. Wind, wasn't I mean, yeah. uh, you know they made the model cars are you know off mm. the London that's, Sydney cars. It, they look quite good in their mm. um, in their day. But that's yeah. that's really for the true believers, the kind of so. the yeah. insiders, the Hillman insiders. You know, with all yeah. the books on the Roots Group and all the rest of it. Those people, but the general pundits don't know. It's not like Bathurst, is it? No. Mm. no. It, I think it, it is what probably one of those less talked about uh, things really out there. Um, mm. You know, even with the Falcons, you, you don't, you know, only a certain key people are, you know, talking mm. about the London and the Sydney runs with those, yeah. So, yeah. so what are the key models in the Hunter? I mean, there was the, the, the Arrow, which was like the, the base level or entry level. I imagine there's not too many of those around now. So we're no, sort of no, looking... The Royale, Hunter, the GT, yeah. uh, the Safari Wagon, which, you know, again, Indeed. even more scarce to find uh, those today yeah. uh, in good condition. Yeah. And, of course, there was that model they brought out called the Hustler, um, which was a really interesting model. I mean, it was a stripper inside, really, but yeah. they dressed it up very much to look like a, a, a Hemi Pacer. Uh, do, you, do you see any of those around? Look, I've got to say, through the auction house, we really haven't seen uh, any come through. Uh, you know, occasionally we might see the odd uh, hunter come through. Mm. Um, we do see a few come through for insurance perspective, but uh, definitely not for sale. I think uh, at the price point of the cars, they're very much an entry level classic. And, mm. uh, so I think most of them do change hands amongst club members uh, or people in that circle. It yeah, probably yeah. follows from that that the top line model, the Hunter GT, which was then replaced by the Royal 660, the, Royal with 660. the same mechanicals yeah. and really quite a nice interior, Very nice genuine interior. walnut mm, dash. Walnut and that's dash really, yep. A yep. car like that, I think, would would have more more value. You think for so. the general public yeah, and yep. for the and for the aficionado than yes. than say than, than the hustler? I would yeah. have thought. Mm. Look, it's a good usable you know usable car, a very good entry point level car as well. So and you know obviously you put your family or your friends in it, so mm. it's practical, easy um, to repair, easy to repair, parts availability. Yep. 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 So you know it's probably not a bad. You know, so solution. things like things like the GT, the Royal 660, the the, the, the upspec versions with the nice interior, that's the one to aim for if you can find them? I think that that's probably what you go for, is probably the rarer of the variants. Mm. Um, and, and again, probably the ones that were better equipped. Uh, you know, talk about the Walnut Dash, your twin carbs on some nice. yeah. So yeah, that's probably yeah. what you'd be looking for, I think. All right, Chris, mm. thanks for joining us. No problem. And you can keep up to date with all the latest Shannon's Auctions news on the Shannon's Club website. If you want a lasting memory of the Hillman Hunter in competition, check out the huge archive at autopix.com.au. John, we touched on the, the awkward relationship, you could say, between Chrysler and the Roots Group in Australia, but I think Chrysler Australia really tried their best to, to bring those British cars into their fold, didn't they? I think they did a good job. Mm. Uh, as we mentioned, things like using the Safari name for the Hunter wagon to yep. link with the Valiant, and even the, the Regal 770 the Royal 660 and the same buffalo grain vinyl in it and the steering wheels being shared, yeah, and, that was and, and, quite clever. And the Hustler, you know, that was, that was Hemi It was orange. like a Hemi Pacer. Yeah, it yep. was made, made to look like a mini Pacer, so they, they were trying pretty hard to make it work, weren't they? Yes, and they weren't really working with the very best material when you think about it either. And it was a pretty awkward, I mean, I think Chrysler Australia were happy to see the end of the, the, the Hilton and the Port Melbourne plant because it was causing them all sorts of grief toward the end of it. I think they would have found it a bit easier with its successor, the uh, Mitsubishi Cockland. Yeah, which yeah. is another story altogether. Indeed it is. Mm. Well, we hope you've enjoyed reflecting on the Hillman Hunter. We look forward to your company next time on Shannon's Club TV. Bye for now.